Uh, welcome back to our time of study, and especially that we've turned to a new page, and that is the page of caregivers, talking to caregivers so that they would be strengthened in the care that they give unto others. And so tonight we continue our lesson. Dr. Barry is out of town. We're praying for her, and we thank God for Sister Gore. Uh, uh, she'll probably be, be with us on next Tuesday. But we thank God tonight that we have our lesson. We're going to continue in our study. Sister Lee is going to lead us in a song tonight, and we will then go into our study. Sister Lee. Good evening, everyone. Help me sing. I've got a new home over in Zion. I got a new name over in Zion. I got a new song over in Zion. I've got a new home over in Zion. And it's mine, and it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. I got a new, I got a new home over in Zion. And it's mine, mine, mine. Name, I got a new name over in Zion. Oh, and it's mine, mine, it's mine, mine, mine. mine. Oh, I got a new name yeah. over in Zion. Yeah. And it's mine, 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 mine. It's mine. Song, I got a new song over oh, in Zion. Zion. And it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. I've got a new snow over in Zion. Oh, and it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. Shout. I got a new shout over in Zion. Oh, and it's mine, and mine, it's mine. I got a, a new, new shout, shout over in Zion. Zion. Oh, and it's mine, mine. it's mine. mine, it's mine. Father God, we thank you now for that new home and that new, that new shout, the new song, dear God, that you have waiting for us in Zion. But dear God, while we're here in time, we thank you for the new hope that you have given us. And thank you, dear God, for new mercies. Every morning that we wake up, you are there to impart your mercies unto us. We thank you, Father. Pray tonight, dear God, as we come back to our study, dear God, that you would uh, uh, illumine my mind to the things you'd have me to teach to your people tonight, dear God. And I pray, Father, that you not only anoint me with your spirit and illumine my mind, but fill me with your spirit, that I will teach with power from on high, dear God, that I will glory your name and that you, dear God, would benefit our souls. Lord, in Jesus' name, we pray tonight. Amen. Amen. We have been talking about caregivers, and Dr. Barry had given us a good introduction on last week. And tonight, I want to share with you uh, a little further into that study about giving care to others and what we need to have and to be to be a good caregiver. And whether you become a caregiver gradually or all of a sudden due to some crisis, or whether you're a caregiver willingly or by default, many emotions surface when you take on the job of caregiver. Now, the Apostle Paul had been through many shipwrecks, he'd been through many beatings, he'd been through many re most, much rejection, he'd been shipwrecked twice, bit by a poison snake. And listen, let me tell you something. And, but Paul says, I still gave care to the body of Christ. I was called to be a caregiver to the body of Christ. And all of that God had anointed him as he anoints us in our roles as caregivers. And in that role, Peter, Peter says, listen, this is what you need to do if you want to be a caregiver. 
First of all, you got to understand that you have cares. You have things that need to be cared for. In order to be an efficient caregiver, you must cast your cares upon him. <laughs> Why? Because he cares for you. God has proven to us down through the ages that he cares for us. Even outside or inside of the Garden of Eden, God showed that he cared for us. Over in Abraham's uh, land, he showed that he cares for us. Over in Zion, over in Jerusalem, even when he had Joseph to go to Egypt, when Israel went to Egypt, God still cares for us. And so as caregivers, we want to give efficient care. We're going to have to realize we have some cares in this world. But we have a, a person who can. We have a father who can. He's able to take care of each one of the burdens and cares that we have in our life. You see, some of these, these feelings happen right away when you start to become a caregiver. When you find yourself uh, giving care to a loved one or, or, or just being on assignment with someone, you realize that, that you have a, 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 a feelings that happen to you, and they will surface real quick when you start to give care to somebody else. Why? Because that's a part of you. There's no need to be ashamed of it. There's no need of pretending you don't have them because they are there. Whatever your situation is, it is important to remember, for, for you to remember, that you also are important. I know the assignment is important when we, when we go to take care of someone, but you got to realize you're somebody's assignment also. And number one, you're God's assignment, and God cares for you. So you're going to have to care for yourself as well. All of your emotions, whether they're good or bad, about caregiving, listen, <laughs> they are valid to you. They are important to you. You can't just take yours and push them all the way to the side. I know many times you have to sacrifice. That's not what God is trying to tell us. He's telling us that you come with some issues too. And when you come with those issues, he wants to deal with them. That's why he wants us to cast all of our cares on him because he cares for us. We can't be any good for others when we can't have good for ourselves. Many feelings come up. When you're caring for someone day in and day out, many caregivers set out saying that, listen, this won't happen to me because I love my mother and I love my father. Ain't nothing going to come between us. Nothing's going to make me angry. I'm going to do this. I love my husband. I love my wife, my sister, my brother, my friend, whoever it is. But after a while, the negative emotions that we tend to want to bury and pretend that we aren't feeling, they will come up. Because it's a taxing job. It is not an easy job. It's not like uh, eating haagen every night. No, there's some nights you're going to eat some, some, beer, some, some, some bitter herbs. And when that happens, then your emotions that you have to give attention to and have to give care to, those emotions will surface to the top. Caregivers are often reluctant to express these negative feelings because they don't want to be judged. They don't want to be judged by others. Or they don't want to judge themselves. Or they do not even want to burden others with their problems. We say, listen, now, this, is, this is mine. You know, this is, this is something I've got to do, and it is. But that does not mean you don't have any cares of your own. And that's why Peter keeps driving this home in our minds and in our hearts. Cast all of your cares onto him because he loves you. If you do not deal with all of your emotions, then you, 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 you can be like a two-year-old who wants your, you know, when that two-year-old is, when they want attention, those emotions will be begging and, 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 and crying in your ears all day long. Say, I want you to give me some attention. Not paying attention to your own feelings can lead you to poor sleep, can lead you to illness. And trouble with coping and stress and, and substance abuse. Oh, yeah. 
You know that stress will uh, uh, make you reach for something. You're going to have to get, uh, and many times when stress is on, you see people uh, gain weight. Depression makes you lose weight, but that stress will make you gain weight because you want to satisfy it. When you finally admit to your feelings, you can then find uh, pr productive ways to express them and deal with them that you and the care receiver can cope better in the future. See, if you haven't dealt with what's, what's bothering you, you won't be effective in dealing with what's bothering them. No matter how much you know about what's bothering them, you have to take care of you as well. And not many people are going to tell us that. He's going to tell us, hey, just get in there and do it. You should be able to do it. You've done all this stuff before. But you must take care of you. God says that he, he told Peter to let the church know, tell them to cast all of their cares upon me. Because I do. I do care for them. Now I'm going to run through some things that we that I want caregivers to understand, some of the things that could happen, some of the things that could block that, that good flow of communication and that good care that you really want to give unto people. Sister Barry went through a few of these on last time. I want to go through a few more. Number one is ambivalence. That is the feeling of both wanting, <laughs> wanting to, 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 to do it and not wanting to do it. Some days you really want to do it, and some days you just don't. And you're never going to tell anybody about the day you don't want to do it. No, no. You'll be happy and proud about the days that you really want to get to that work and do it, but not on those days that you just don't want to do it. And sometimes when you do let it out, it's going to all come out. And so we need to understand ambivalence is real. On, on, on bad days, one might often uh, have the feeling of wishing that, that they didn't, didn't have to be there in that position to take care of somebody else. And that this ordeal maybe will soon be over. Usually it's not. We don't, know, we don't know God's timing. On good days of caring for someone, it could be a gift to us, to both you and the receiver, because you're happy and they're happy. And that's why you got to deal with the things that are bothering you. When you get to that point of ambivalence, the author in the study that I was looking at gives us a solution. It's called coping. Allow yourself to feel both sets of feelings. Stop, stop saying, I can't feel this way. Allow yourself to feel both sets of feeling. Don't worry about it. You know, you, it, it's, you, you're not going to get a label of something horrible, you know, on, on yourself. Life's not going to turn around because you, you understand that you have that feeling. You acknowledge you have that feeling. Everyone has these feelings sometimes. But neither the bad feelings or the good feelings will last forever. They all have a cycle. There's a time for everything. <laughs> There's a season and a time. There are cycles. Seasons are longer than the times. The times are a little short periods of time. But there are seasons sometimes we might fall into these things. Number two, anger. How often have you lost it while providing care? I mean, you, you really wanted to do the best thing. You were there with the best intentions. But, oh, man, you, you, your mind just said, not today. And so you lose it. And that's just, it's real. Or you, 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 you felt like uh, you were, they, were, they were on your last nerve. Anger and frustration are a normal part of being around someone who needs help on an ongoing basis. It's natural. It's natural. And who might not be accepting of that help with a thank you. you know? <laughs> Sometimes there's not going to be thank yous. Sometimes there'll be rejections, pushback, caring for someone that has a, a, um, a, 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 an ongoing disease or, or, or illness can be, even be harder because the caregiver can be, uh, I'm sorry, the care receiver can be irrational and combative. Sometime when they have that ongoing illness, they could be ir irrational and combative. It's not always possible to be in perfect control of your emotions. So anger just comes out. 
at some time. Now, let me just say this to you that uh, I don't know if I shared this with this church before. Uh, I've shared so many stories when I was uh, orderly down here at, at Jackson South. Uh, it was uh, the Deering Hospital back then. And I was there and uh, I had to go get an elderly man. Uh, I think he was about 90 something and take him down to x ray. And I went to get him, frail looking gentleman. He looked like grandson, a great great grandson, young guy by 15. He was there, easygoing guy. And um, I guess the man's wife was there. She looked like she was up in age with him. And so I, they said, you need some help with uh, putting him on the stretcher? I said, no, ma'am. I know how to take the sheet, roll it up, wrap him up in it, and just slide him over to the, to the stretcher. And I'm on this side of the stretcher. It's not going anywhere. I have a, they, they taught us a process. And I did it, and I brought him over to the stretcher. When I brought him over to the stretcher, that frail old man, Kicked me in my mouth so hard. Oh, he kicked me in my mouth so hard. Boom. Well, y'all know that ain't the end of the story, right? <laughs> because me pulling that sheet became me snatching that sheet and putting him on that stretcher. The stretcher bounced up in there, and the little boy said, You need some help, mister? I said, No, I got him. No, oh, I got him. <laughs> he got me and I got him. <laughs> but sometimes that happens. I mean, it was automatic. I guess maybe it was automatic for him to kick me in my mouth. But it was automatic for me to snatch him up and bang him on that, on that stretcher. Now, that's 50 years ago, so I hope nobody's around. <laughs> and that will happen sometimes. Sometimes, listen, <laughs> you, you, you've snatched your kids before. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and you know you love them, but you snatched them before, ever. And so sometimes in giving care, that part, that anger that I just described and defined for you, that comes up sometimes. Now, how do you cope? Forgive yourself. Ask God for forgiveness. Ask the person, if they're, you know, aware, for forgiveness. And then forgive yourself. The longer you beat yourself up over it, the, the longer it takes for you to get back into that positive caregiving mode. Because after then, you feel guilty. When the guilt sets in, you're not your effective self in giving care. And you have to realize that you have to be cared for too. No one should spit on you or kick you and all of that other stuff. But maybe sometimes they can't help. But then you have to understand that you are a human taking care of another human. And by the grace of God, who is omnipotent and who has all power in his hand, he asks us, well, take that particular care and cast it on me. Ask for forgiveness. And when I forgive you, forgive yourself. Let at least, if it's going to be a reminder to you, remind you not to do it again, but not to make you less effective in doing what you know to do. Find constructive ways to express yourself. Learn to, to walk away. Give yourself a time out. Now, sometimes you have to give yourself a time out. Just, just walk away and give yourself a time out. Let it go down some. Identify supportive people that you can talk to who will listen as you vent about the things that happened to you that day. Find somebody. All right? Now, don't find two people. Don't find don't find the town drunk, and don't find the town gossip. Find somebody you could talk to that's going to listen to you, be good listening, give you some good advice to build you back up. Then there are times of anxiety, feeling like things are out of control and not knowing how to bring them back into control. It often produce, produces feelings of anxiousness. Anxiety can emerge as a short fuse. The impulse to run away, to not sleep, all of a sudden you have an urge to cry, and even sometimes you have heart palpitation. You get yourself so wound up that you just, your blood pressure goes up, the heart rate goes up. 
because of the anxiety. And when you're caring for people, there are times, it's not so much, I'm talking about anger now, we're talking about anxiety. There are times when you look at them, you care for them, you love them, and you see that they're choking. Man, that anxiety will run your pressure up so quick, especially if you don't know how to deal with the issue that's before you. It'll make you sick. Well, how do you cope? The author says, by paying attention to your anxiety. It is your body's early warning system that tells you something isn't, isn't right. That anxiety comes upon you, it's telling you something isn't right. But then we tell you what else your body tells you. We don't listen to it most times. It tells you stop. That's what it says. Your body tells you just stop. And when you stop, it says, don't just stop now. Breathe before you drop down. And don't just breathe, breathe deeply. And don't do it for two times. Take your time and let your blood pressure go back down. Fill your lungs with oxygen. Give yourself that which makes your blood most efficient, oxygen. Stop. Pray. For those of us who have a spiritual conscience, pray. Make some tea if you have to. Hot tea, don't mess with that. Don't go to McDonald's and get that tea with that sugar because it's, it's going right back up. If you make some hot tea. Squeeze a little lime in it or something. Anything that will give you a break from what's happening at the moment. That's what your body is trying to tell you when anxiety goes up. Anxiety lets you know something wrong. Your body is telling you, stop. And then we can get ourselves into this issue, this feeling of boredom. It's easy to become bored when you're stuck at home taking care of someone else and not doing the things that you used to be doing that fulfill all your own wants and needs. And at the end of the day, you are often too tired to pursue the interest of you. Now, I'll say this. I keep seeing it on the Facebook. And I guess these young people are kind of catching on now. Um, now, those of us who are over a certain age, uh, we don't mind not having a whole lot of interest anymore. And I see this on the, on the Facebook all the time where they say, hey, you know my... My, um, my, 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 my 35 time to be at home used to be 1 o'clock. Now, my 45-year-old time is to be home at 9.30. <laughs> my 65-year-old time is to be in the bed at 9.30. <laughs> we got, so, I mean, it's, it's just that you cannot take yourself out of everything that pleases you. No, you got to do some things. You got to do some things. And so when you cope with that boredom, uh, 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 you got to give yourself what they call respite. That's a break, a time out. Time out, giving yourself a break from caregiving. Have some time for yourself. Uh, and and, and you, could, you, could, you could do it through walking, socializing, whatever you do that, that perks up your interest. Even if you get by yourself and read a book or you go, whatever it is that, that gets you uh, uh, going and the things that you like, your, your favorite TV show. I know we can't do a whole lot of going now because of, of the pandemic. In some ways, that's good. In some ways, it's really good because it gets us some quiet time now. We're always in big cities used to nothing but noise, 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 noise. Noise everywhere. Lights everywhere. But now you can have some of that respite, that time of time out, that time of taking a break. Then there are times when we become cranky and irritable. You say, you're talking about us, the caregiver, or the patient? No, the caregiver. We become cranky and irritable. When, when you're tired and stressed, it is harder to stay in control of your feelings and your emotions. Feelings can go up and down very rapidly when you get cranky and irritable. We can lash out at the littlest thing, the smallest thing, because uh, we have no reserve. I mean, we, 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 it's like, you know, we're at the end now, and now you're going to pull this at the end. Now you really got me cranky, really got me. You, you, know, you know how it was when we were growing up. And sometimes 
I don't know about your parents. Sometimes they tell you, hey, stop. Some people didn't tell you stop. They just pop, you know. But there was a point you know you got to the end of mother or father's uh, 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 line of patience. And when they got to that end, it was no, and no crying could stop them. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not all that. I love you, Ma. Uh-uh, you're getting it now. And sometimes in giving care, you know, you, you've made sacrifices all day, all week, and, and, and we're here we are back at the same thing again. I'm trying to get you to do this. And sometimes that can come. And so what the author tells us to cope with that, if you find yourself feeling cranky and irritable, you probably need a break. I think so. And you also may need to get some rest, not just a break, but some rest. As we are in less control when we are tired. You got to come to that realization. We are in less control when we're tired. We're in more control when we're rested. Often we'll turn, some people, what the author talks about, turn into alcohol or, or junk food or all the other things that we get involved with to reward ourselves because we feel like, man, I've just had it. But it's more beneficial for you to do something positive. Some of you could write, write a journal. Some of you uh, have close friends, find a friend, talk to a friend. Uh, some of you uh, know how to let off steam. You're good at it. Go the way you let off steam, you know. Or go out there and try to shoot three-pointers. I know you're going to miss five or nine. Y'all didn't get that. <laughs> you're going to miss just about all of them you shoot, but go out there and let the steam off. Go out there. Put your tennis shoes on. Go out and let the steam out. Go out there and get a punching bag. Put it in the backyard. Punch it. You ain't going to do it but three times. You're going to be tired after that. Just punch it. You know, get it all out. <laughs> all right. But then there's depression and sadness. You see, uh, anxiety and, 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 and crankiness, that's when we, uh, we flare up. But depression is when we go down, when we're deflated. And we know when you keep taking care of people over and over, you get deflated. And, and you wind up being depressed. Now, my, my heart goes out to every caregiver, but especially frontline caregivers. They are professionals. They've known how to do this forever, but now they're so overwhelmed. They're so overwhelmed. I'm, 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 I'm surprised. And I pray all the time, you know, because I'm just surprised that I don't see them jumping off buildings. This is horrible. That you know you're caring for someone that, that's either terminal or, 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 or going to be really uh, uh, messed up uh, 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 physically for the rest of their lives. And their, pay, their, their, their family can't even come in to see them. But you're with them all day. And you don't know if they can ever give you enough inoculation to, uh, because you're there all day. And you're dealing with every part of their lives. And you feel so much for the people. Oh, and can you imagine the babies in these, these wards that they're taking care of? And so depression could set in. As a caregiver, you are, uh, we're all at risk of depression. Sometimes it's a feeling of hopelessness and helplessness. It means that, you know, even if I had the hope and the, and the energy to do it, I, I, I just don't think there's nothing I could do. It's overwhelming. And, and we could get to that point. Depression is the inability to sleep. The inability to sleep or trouble getting up and facing the day. That's one of the big ones too. Sleep, sleep deprivation, and I just don't want to get up and face the day. I don't want to get up and wash my face. I don't want to get up and put anything on. I just don't want to get up. I don't want you to open the blinds. I don't want you to say anything nice to me. I don't want to have anything but darkness. And many times, and probably most of the time with depression, it makes you cry. It makes you cry. The author gives us a coping technique. Depression is treatable and should be taken seriously. Professional help is available. For depression. Talk to your physician. He'll give you a reference. He'll tell you what he thinks about the degree of depression that you have. And then not only that, join a support group. 
Join a support group. You know, and it, it's, it's um, if you look at America and look at all of what we have, especially in terms of communications and, you know, other countries have, them, have it too, but we have so much and people live so close to us. We have uh, all kind of groups that we've all been in. All kind of groups, service groups, uh, our, our class reunions, our, our, our friends, or, you know, baking group, or whatever it is. And yet, in times like this, we don't feel comfortable or confident enough to go to them to help us, to help relieve the depression, that they would actually take my problems. You see, and this is why Peter keeps saying to the caregivers, cast your cares on him. Now, that doesn't mean that God wouldn't lead you back to that group. Or he'll lead you to the right person. I can't tell you, and I know many of you all, I know many of you all had some bad days. And all of a sudden, somebody you hadn't heard from and now know when will call you with the right words. Oh, just say, just the right thing to you. I wasn't even having a bad day. Yesterday we were over at Mount Moriah. Very good service we had over there. Great time and everything. And I was getting ready to, to get back in my car and go. And there was a young man that I saw. He was assisting the pastor. And he and I had spoken. And I've seen him before at other churches. And then we were getting ready to go out. And he stopped me right in front of his pastor there. And he said, this man I've known since I was a kid. Huh? He said, yeah. He said, we were in our race and all that at Glendale, and I was there. And then he told me who he was. His, his face had changed so much, and he matured so much, because this was many decades ago. And, and he says, he said, and he is one of the reasons that I did this or that or this. He was our role model. He was this. I was waiting for him to say, like most of them say, he thumped me side of the head, but he didn't say that, thank God. <laughs> But, but can you imagine, my day wasn't even bad, but he lifted me higher. And God knows how to send people like that. But you got to take your cares and cast them on him. See, God knows how to work those moments out for you. God knows how to make things come at the right time. I can't stop quoting you. God does all things well, Dr. Weary. <laughs> he knows. He knows just how to do it and when to do it. So depression is treatable. It is treatable. And then you're going to, they're going to, the counselor is going to help you and tell you this now about depression. You're going to have to get that blood circulating. You're going to have to do some movement, some walking. You don't have to run, but you're going to have to do some walking, some kind of movement, and start that, that circulation of that blood where the blood gets rich in oxygen, where, and, and each one of those organs and, and then your brain receives it, it receives it, and gets nutriment. Of the basic thing is oxygen in your body body moving. What else? What about disgust? Sometimes you could get disgusted. Oh, yeah. You could get disgusted. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on disgust because disgust is talking about, uh, you know, you could, you, you could become a caregiver and you think that all you're going to do is sit down with them some days and crochet, look at the soap operas or go for a walk with them. But there sometimes in caregiving, many times in caregiving, you're going to have to change some dirty diapers or, or, or you're going to have to clean up that bathroom or you're going to have to see them uh, upchuck and you're going to have to be there feeling like you want to upchuck yourself. Listen, I, I know because I, from a kid, let me tell you, from a kid, I know my mom, when most people say nice nasty, they mean they can say something to you nice nasty. But when my mom would talk, call me nice nasty, it would be something like this. She took Red, Reginald off to the store with her. They had a good time. She came back. She pulled the car in the backyard. I said, why did she put in the backyard? So I went to take the groceries out. Reginald was about three, I think, three or four years old. And she said, he threw up in the car. She said, I'll get the groceries out. You clean up the vomit. She came back out. There. She heard me out the gag. <laughs> she said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> So when you give care, it's going to be some disgusting times. I'm not going to labor on this, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I got an amen over there. <laughs> it's going to be some, some disgusting times. And sometimes when you go out, 
in public. You know, maybe some embarrassing times where you take the person out there in public. Some people don't like to leave their homes now because they don't feel good in public. Now, one of the things they recommended here, and I, I don't see uh, anyone really in this church doing this, but one of the things they recommend, if you go out in public, you might want to take a little card say, this person has, um, uh, uh, you know, stomach cancer and he's liable to throw up. And that, you know, kind of, I don't think we're going to be doing that. Now, that. That might work for some people, but I'm looking around. I don't see anybody here that that's going to work. But you have to find a way to cope with it. And the longer you deal with it. Now, let me tell you this. That's how I grew up. And I'm telling you the truth. That's how I grew up. Even going to the funeral home. They would say, come on, we got to go. I mean, you look here, they're not going to let you stay home. You got to go. But I don't want to get out of the car. And they said, well, you don't want to go in? Uh-uh. I got to go to the bathroom. Well, come in, they got one in. I ain't going to use that. <laughs> but you know what life taught me? Especially after I started working at Larkins Hospital and then down here at Deering. It got me to the point where I would take a bod the body of someone who had just passed, help the nurse wrap it and clean it up. Take it down to the morgue, and I wasn't even working for the nurses. I was working for x-ray, but I would help them. I would take it to the morgue, put it on those one of the three slabs we had in that morgue down here, wash my hands, and go to lunch. Cafeteria is right across from the hallway from me. That's how, and God will develop you. You got to take your cares and cast it on him, only God. I know y'all saying, yeah, that's right, only God, Pastor. <laughs> All right. And then, not only that, you need to get some training, especially when people are discontinent like that. You need to get some, or incontinent, you need to, to get some training. They could tell you certain type of diapers they could wear. They tell you certain spoons to keep them from the spilling all the time when they eat. These are things that you, you get yourself a little training. And, and there are a lot of groups that will do it for nothing. There are a lot of friends of yours that are nurses. They'll tell you. They'll tell you what to do. They'll do it for nothing. And then there is embarrassment embarrassment. <laughs> and many times now, the, uh, the, the care receiver uh, won't always make complimentary comments about you and around you. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll just come right out and say it. And they may not have no control. Sometimes we think they know exactly what they're saying and what they're doing. Like I thought that man knew he was kicking me in my mouth. I, I really did. <laughs> I had to ask the Lord, forgive me quick. But when you get into those embarrassing uh, uh, times, you have to stop and, and de-escalate the person. Whatever you do to escalate it, they'll just get worse with it. You got to stop and de-escalate it. And sometimes things will still come out of their mouth. But you can't control all of it can't control all of it. And then there is uh, fear. What if something happens? Will I be able to cope? Will I feel guilty? Am I responsible for the things that go wrong? Caregivers take on a huge amount of responsibility, not only for the day-to-day the -day care of the, of, the, of the receiver, but also for all the other things that might happen while being a caregiver. Scaring ourselves about the what ifs only paralyzes us about the what is. See, if we, we get caught up in the fear, let the fear grip us, then we won't be able to think through to, through to what the solutions are. What if I go in there and this man that smokes all the time put, drops that cigarette in that bed and that bed's on fire? We, do, we go through all the what ifs. What if, uh, you know, there's a million things I won't even go through. You all know what I'm talking about. And we go through these what ifs. What if they fall? What if this happens? That happens. If you, if you let that takes, take all of your time and your energy, you won't be productive as a caregiver because then you, you be, you'll be caught up by every anxiety and fear that there is. And it will be all over you. So when you start to understand, yeah, this could happen and this could happen. This is what I have in place for this. This is what I have in place for that. And even if it means calling 911, even if it means uh, running out on the road, jumping out of your car, stopping somebody to help, 
You'll be surprised. Yeah, there are a lot of mean people in every one of our cities, but there's sure a lot of good Samaritans too. A lot of them. And then frustration. Frustration is a part of many other feelings, such as ambivalence. You know, I want to do it. Man, I don't want to do it anymore. It's part of anger. It's part of impatience. Sometimes as a caregiver, you feel that you can't do anything right or things that just go on as planned. No matter what you have done, no matter how hard you try, and if you are tired, you are more than likely to get frustrated. And frustrated will lead you to stress. And stress will make you do a lot of things. You could overeat. You could just over, over everything. Sometimes I wonder in the mornings when I get up, um, have I been gritting my teeth? Because that jaw will be hurting a little bit over here. I say, man, maybe I'm, I'm thinking. And, then, and that's why I start turning the TV off. Because I know many times what I was probably gritting my teeth was, uh, what they call that thing? Uh, Hill Street Blues. They was always beating somebody up in the jail, and I thought they was in my house, I guess. Now, get them, get them. <laughs> but we've got to understand. We could get frustrated. We get frustrated. We got to acknowledge how frustrating uh, caregiving can be. That's the first thing. See, if you, if you come in blind about that, if you just try to keep play, pa pa painting uh, 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 the bed of roses about that, it's going to always get you. It's going to catch you because it's not a bed of roses. You pray that it will be most days, but it won't always. That's the first thing you got to do is acknowledge that it's frustrating. Join a support group. You, not the, the person you're giving care to. You join a support group. Learn the tricks that caregivers give, that they do. There's all kinds of tricks. Let's go there and, you know, look, kids be coming in. To, to get a, a, a shot, and boy, the doctors would do all this on this side, and they would get ready to shoot him, and this on. They do all kind of things for them, the little kids, and then they get the thing, and sometimes the kid just be playing, especially if you've been put that lollipop in this hand over here, and then he look, he might cry it in, <laughs> but it's all over. <laughs> it's all over. Now, you can't do it like we used to do it. You got to get a lot of breaks from all of this, but you can't do it like you used to do it because my mama took my brother to the dentist. Uh, I think he was 11 or 12. It might have been 10 or something. Taking that dentist, and he kept crying and crying. She said, Mr., can I have one minute? The dentist came back in there. He was all right. I'll let you figure that out. <laughs> now, you can't do that now. I'm going to tell you you can't. Now, I don't know if they still have it, but many of y'all might have known or heard about the wet rag, the nurse with the wet rag, right? Y'all, anybody know what that means? That means that patient was going to get it when them, that family leave. <laughs> oh, he's going to get it. <laughs> now, you can't do that. Anymore. Don't hit nobody with the wet rag. Hit him with a dry one. No. <laughs> and then grief. Watching the care of the person that you care for decline could make you grieve heavily. That's a natural thing. And I always tell people about grief when I'm preaching the funeral. Grief is equivalent with love. As much as you love them, that's how much you grieve over them. If you, if you think that they're slipping away, if you think that this is such a, a, a bad situation, you're going to have grief. It's a natural feeling. We also grieve for the care receiver. We don't just grieve for ourselves, but for the care receiver. That's who we're grieving about. The person who used to be this kind of person person used to be this for me and that for me and this with me and that with me then now no more of that with me no more and it causes grief and we often need to grieve the loss that we're experiencing on a daily basis or it will all fall down on you one time as heavy grief deep grief the author says for coping sometimes you gotta uh, you have to create a ritual that could be helpful. Um, one, one caregiver would write down on a piece of paper the things that her husband could do and then the things he could no longer do. She'd go to the ocean and tear up the pieces and throw it out in the sea. Others have gone to prayer. Others have gone to groups. Others have gone to where they actually promote self-healing, asking you and teaching you how to get through this time. Not get over it, but get through it. Some, some, most times, grief is very hard to get over. 
it's easier to get through it than to try to go over it. You know what I'm talking about. That's that, that man that was running for, uh, what was that team playing last night? They beat the other team so bad. He was running through them like there was, it was, it was butter on the defensive line. You could get through some of these things easier, but our minds always tell us to get over it. How can you get over that for somebody that you love? And see, God will bring us through it. That's why Peter says you got to learn to take all of your cares and cast them on him. You think about Peter, a rough, tough guy. He ain't had no care for nobody. He was tough. He was a fisherman. Cuss him out, took that sword and cut that man off right there in front of Jesus. And you know he was bad. But when his mother-in-law got sick, you know what he found out? I cast my cares about my mother-in-law on him. And God went right there and raised her up. Peter said, I, I lost all my hope when I saw him crucify him on that cross. I went down there to tell him off, but I couldn't even go in there. A, a, a passing little girl that pointed me out. He said, but I found out as bad as I felt. And I walked away, went back to my fishing boat. Bad as I felt, the Lord still met me. The Lord met me. <laughs> Matter of fact, the Lord sent for me. He told the ladies when they left the grave that morning, he said, listen, this is what I want you to do. Go tell them that, that, that he is risen. And say, and bring Peter too. Bring him on with you. And they went out there and they was out there fishing on the water. And they called him in. Peter said, y'all can row this boat in. I know they're my boats and my daddy's boat. You can row this boat in. I'm going to swim in. Because that's the man that helped me. That's the one that brought me through. That's the one that helped me get over. There's hope for us, God. That's why Peter gave us that in, in 1 Peter 3. He has saved us to a living hope, a rebounding hope, that we can come back and go through these things and get through them. And that's why I started with his scripture, cast all of your cares on him, on him who, on God the Father, on God the Son, who is our advocate sitting right next to God on his right hand, and God the Holy Spirit, who the Son prayed that God will give to us as an indweller to walk with us and talk with us every day of our life. All I'm saying, take your cares and cast them on him. And he is able to take you through. Any comments or questions tonight? Amen. They need to hear you at home. <laughs> I'll I let, let you hit me with the wet rag. <laughs> Thank you, sister. Got to hit that button. I'm sorry. That's okay. See that button? Yeah, the light, red light came on. There you go. Thank you. All of this is so very fresh to me, you mm -hmm. know, because I've just, you know, gone through this. And then, of course, when I think about it, I have just been, I've given care to two husbands, and I'm giving care to my, my grown uh, son now and been doing it since he was 22 years old. There are degrees of it. Um, there was a time in his life when he couldn't even brush his own teeth. That's how bad he was. You wouldn't know it to see him today. But I, what I really rose to say was that these sessions have been very good. My neighbor called me on yesterday, and I was on the line. I was surprised when she called, and so I answered her. I said, I'll call you back. I'm on the other line. And when I called her back, she went on to tell me that she had her mother there, and her cousin had come to see me um, the other day, and she told me that she had brought them back from uh, Georgia somewhere. And so she was saying to me, you know, what she was going through and how she's just having such a hard time and how her, her uh, she's had been having to give care to her husband. And she, her son says to her mom, you just going to break, break all the way down because you done had to take care of dad, and now, you have, now you're taking on grandmama. And, of course, she had taken her mother from her brother in another city and another state 
because he, he had had her for a year. The marriage was in trouble, and all kind of things began to happen behind the caregiving that had to be done. So when she called me, I was able to encourage her in the things that I had learned in the session and as well as personal experience. So I was able to say to her, hang in there. It's going to be all right. And I said, and one of the things that I do want to tell you is just to make sure that you take some time for yourself. If you have to go, I said, you got that big, nice house. I said, you have to go in another room. If you have to go out on a pet, whatever you have to do, find your time and find your spot to be able to get away. I said, because it is very difficult trying to, I don't care how much you love them, it becomes difficult. And we chatted a while, and when we, and I told her that we were in these sessions, and when we finished, she said, thank you so much. I just needed to talk to somebody. And so it's good when you're going through your stuff to talk to somebody. Even though I had a hard time, the one good thing that I did have, I had a sister that she was not going to allow me to go through it by myself. Though she could do not as much as I could, she would come. And she would say moral support. And the moral support was good. And so what the two of us did, went in our up and down, we took time to do what we love to do. The whole family loves it. We played Scrabble. So I'm saying that encourage people to, I wish I had known, as I said before, all this stuff before I began to go through. And God forbid that I should have to go through anything like this anytime soon. But I would be more equipped because I would, you have all this stuff. And that's why Paul says all these things are written for our admonition. So here it is. We're getting all these things, whether we are here or whether we are listening uh, via the uh, whatever those things are. We know that we have something that we can hold on to because it's good to learn. We got to be like the church of Berea. We got to search to know what we have to do. And so I thank you all for these sessions that we've been having. They've been a blessing to me, even though I have been through them. It's still a blessing to me. God bless you. And we, we thank you. Listen, more important than what I'm teaching is what you're teaching. See, that's personal experience. And you know, I'm telling you, people are relating to this in this room and, and in, uh, out on our live stream. People are learning. That this, these are this valuable things. These are things sometimes you can't find in the books. And that's why we wanted to, to be there, out there. And a perfect testimony. You don't know how many people right now you helped tonight just with that. And I'm serious. I'm very, very serious. Anyone else tonight? Is this Lee? Yes. Mm -hmm. I like to say that I'm so glad that we're having this training because you all know that I was a caregiver for my mother and she was 96 years old and I had to bring her from Jacksonville down here and I was cold turkey. I went into caregiving, I didn't know anything. I had to learn as I go. And I listened to you list all of those feelings. I experienced many of those feelings, and then I used to feel bad because I thought that I shouldn't feel like that. So I think this is going to help people that are put into that position because I didn't know I was going to be okay. I knew that I would have to care for my mother, but I had to stop everything. My life stopped, and I had to center everything around taking care of her. And you know, your daily activities change because your life is centered around taking care of the person. Your schedule is centered around them. So probably if I had heard some of this news, I would um, have learned how to use it. <laughs> but I made it through. I. Um, heard someone say, whenever you're feeling depressed, call on Jesus. So I was calling on Jesus a lot. And my mother used to say, why are you calling Jesus so much? But she didn't know. <laughs> but that, that was my suffice. That's how I got through it. And Jesus helped me through. Thank you. Great testimony. And see, Sister, Sister Lewis didn't know, so you should have told I'm calling them on you, Mama. <laughs> <No, I'm kidding. laughs> 
I, I, I understand what you're saying, Sister Lee. Let me tell you, um, since mother was sick, my mother has been, been sick, and, and, and every now and then since, you, since uh, her sister Carol was living with her, and I didn't say, I said, look, Mama, you're going to have to, Carol's right here with you. You're going to have to, you know, do a little better and get along with. So I told my mother one day, I said, Mom, now Marilyn's around here more than me now, so you, you got to treat her a little better. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and just, we have to prompt them like that. I had to prompt them. But, and I said this, I think it was last week, uh, maybe may been the week before. Many times we think that the people we're giving care to it's just, just adamant about giving us a hard time. But in actuality, it's them that's having a hard time. This is the way they cope with it. This is the way they're going to, you know, uh, uh, um, overcome it or, 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 or cam cam camouflage it. They, they just they go after you. And it's because they're having a hard time. Th their intent is not to make us have a hard time, even though that's what's happening. But they are having a hard time. None of us really know how hard the time is, you know, for them. We just know how hard times are for us, you know. But we don't know about them. God bless you. Thank you, Sister Lee. And let me tell you, Sister Lee's mother, I was in the hospital room. I forgot how old she was when the doctor said, what did he say, a year or six months? About two or three years. Two or three years, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and she lived to 100, what was it? 100, that's right. <laughs> Amen. Thank the Lord. Anyone else want to share? We're going to close in a minute. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. I feel like it was a good lesson tonight, not because I taught it, but because what I hear back from your feedback and what I see in your faces while we're teaching, what I know people on the live stream are getting, and a lot of people that are joining on to our live stream. I thank God for all of you that uh, are joining in on the live stream with us. And we're going to keep going. We'll be back here next Tuesday. We're going to keep going with caregivers. And let me tell you, just about everybody's going to be a caregiver. You start giving care to them when they came into the world. You see, one thing about coming into the world, I, I, I read this story today. Uh, 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 I think it was a minister. I was trying to minister to this lady. And it was a, I'm sorry. It was an older lady in a restaurant, and she saw a younger lady with three little kids. And she was just struggling with him and struggling with him. And the older lady went over to the younger lady and said, right now, right now, the hand trouble. But sooner or later, they're going to be hard trouble. Then what we don't get to understand, when they get older, no matter who it is, they're going to be hand in hard trouble for us. We got to do for them and while we're still feeling the way we feel about them. It'll be hand in heart trouble. But God, take all our cares. Call on Jesus. My grandmother used to say, do sit there sometime and just say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. First, I didn't know what she was doing to I used to have stomach pains, and she'd be rubbing my stomach with that olive oil. Jesus, Jesus. My stomach would get okay. I'd be asleep. <laughs> Grandma, when are you going to cook that chicken tomorrow? <laughs> okay. <laughs> God bless you. We thank God for the study. We're going to pray and close out with that time tonight. Let's pray with me. Father God, we thank you so much for the words of encouragement, the words that lift our spirits so that we could continue to lift the spirits of those who need our care. Pray now to God for caregivers everywhere, especially those frontline workers, Heavenly Father. Even though they're trained, they're overwhelmed with this pandemic, have mercy on them. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just speak to every uh, uh, administrator in every hospital, hospital, every administrator of every government agency, every uh, 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 politician. And, Father, impress upon them the need for them to do something about this virus and about all of the cost of medical attention. They can do it. Because you put it in their coffers to do it. My prayer tonight is that you put it in their mind and heart to do it. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just speak your word. Because I know if you speak it, it'll go everywhere at the same time. 
So speak tonight to those who have charge over these things. That not only to God, they would help those frontline workers, but it will help laymen, like those of us who have to care for loved ones, care for little babies that are sick, care for children that are victims of crime, children being shot in the streets. We thank you that their lives weren't taken, but we got to come home and bring them home and reshape it. Speak to the police officers. Speak to the governors and the legislators. They could put a stop to most of this if they learn to trust in you and hear your voice and answer your call. Help those, dear God, who are taking care not only of little children, but taking care of young adults. You know the desire, dear God, of every family member, especially a mother's heart. They want all of their children, dear God, to, to be somebody and to be somebody productive. And to be somebody who trusts in you. It ain't always working out that way. But we know, dear God, if we would just humble ourselves. Turn from our wicked ways. Seek your face and pray that you could heal this land. Well, you could already, but you will heal the land. So help us to God who are believers to believe with all of our heart that you're going to make a difference. Help those of us that God who are sick ourselves to keep trusting in you and thanking you for every moment of healing. Help us, dear God, who are caring for those with terminal illnesses. As we come to understand that all of our lives are terminal and we shall leave this place. Oh, God, but help us to provide a comfort for them. Help us, dear God, to to be that giver of care. And help us, Father, in all of our shortcomings in giving that care to understand you, the great caregiver, and the way that you love us in spite of, the way that you love us even in the middle of, the way, dear God, that you provide for us and the way to God that this hymnologist wrote, you know our name. Job said, you know the way we take. You know our beginning and our end. Help us to God and strengthen us in giving care. Help us to God not to tie a millstone around our neck. Because some things go wrong or, or sometimes we lose our patience. Oh, Lord, help us to realize that we have a forgiving God. We have a Father who loves us and a Father who can. A Father who we can take all of our cares and cast them upon you. Help us to get in the casting business and to not pick up the burden anymore. For your burden is a light and your yoke is easy. Thank you, Father. Father, we thank you tonight for those that are on live stream and those sitting right here who've been helped to God not only by the teaching but, but by the word of testimony. And God, we thank you that you led us to this lesson so that we can strengthen and fortify the caregivers. Bless them. I pray tonight, dear God, for the caregivers and the care receivers, that tonight you will bless them with one of the blessed nights of sleep, a night of rest, a night of no pain, a night of no discomfort, but a night of rest. Continue to bless us, dear God, with a morning full of mercy. In Jesus' name, 
be with us. Keep watch over us. Keep your Holy Spirit within us. Oh, Lord, and your divine Son on our side, sitting at your right side. For we know, dear God, that if you are for us, we're not worried about who can be against us. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, bless us tonight and keep us in your care. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight, and we look forward to seeing you. Most of you will be on tomorrow's Bible study Zoom, and uh, we look forward to seeing you as well on Sunday morning as the Lord continues to bless us. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your faithfulness.